He's the author of hundreds of articles, book reviews, scholarly papers, and newspaper editorials on matters ranging from ancient Greek, agrarian military history, to foreign affairs, domestic politics, contemporary culture, and of course, California. He's been writing a lot about it lately. He's written or edited 24 books, and he has a new book coming out, Second World Wars in October. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And again, it is my absolute honor to welcome to the stage Victor Davis Hanson. My mother said, never give any advice that you're not willing to follow yourself. So when I did suggest that you don't give, when, when I suggested you don't give up your day job, I have a lot of day jobs, plural, because uh, in the business of writing, you never know when one is going to collapse and another one appears, given the volatile nature. Which reminds me, I got in a big argument with one of my free market, I'm free market too, like you are, but I'm not. I'm for free trade, not unfettered trade. And he said, you know, creative destruction is good and people got to get in their pickup sometimes and go to the oil fields if that's what it takes. And I said, when's the last time somebody called you up and said they're outsourcing your column to somebody in South Korea, you got to learn computer coding at 63. So that, I, we all are free market people, but that level of callousness, which as it is, is explains in some ways the Trump phenomenon, this economic nationalism that took the entire Republican Party by surprise. When I talk about California, I think we all realize that two states, Mississippi and Massachusetts, in the same geographical uh, region, and it's a, it's a schizophrenia. I live in a, the nexus between Tulare, Kings, and Fresno counties. The per capita income of my hometown is $16,000. Average educational level is uh, one year of high school. And I get in the, and the price per square foot of a home is about $120 a square foot. Three hours later, I go to the Stanford campus. The per capita income is about 120000 The per capita, I mean, the square footage is about $1,000 a square foot. And uh, it's like going from Mars to Venus. It doesn't seem like it's in the same state. So what I thought I'd do to make f sense of this disconnect that we're all facing, we can leave the Luke's Hotel after all and go 10 miles and it looks like we're in a different country, is try to play the role of an empirical doctor where you look at symptoms, you come up with a diagnosis, you suggest a therapy or regimen, and then you offer a prognosis. The symptoms are very baffling, though, because they're contradictory. On the one hand, with this new gasoline tax and uh, our sales tax increases a few years ago, and our income tax on top brackets up to 13.3, we now have the highest combined tax basket of almost any state, I think, except Connecticut and Hawaii. We're getting record revenues, but we're projected to run a billion point three deficit this year. On the one hand, California is praised because the energy consumption per person has gone to all-time lows, and the percentage of so-called green renewable energy is at all-time highs, yet the price per kilowatt is up to 15 cents and climbing and projected to be 30 cents pretty soon precisely because so many people are going into solar power that the infrastructure overhead is being almost unbearable for those like me who haven't gone green yet. So when you think of California, it, there's a disconnect with all of that revenue coming in and all of those high taxes. What gets people angry is not paying for it but being insulted to pay for it as you get very little in return. Now, what do I mean by that? Forbes magazine rated California infrastructure 49th in the country. This is, a, this is the state that invented the clover leaf and the freeway system. When I was 12 years old, going to Disneyland was about a three-hour proposition on the new 99 freeway. Two lanes, no cross. It hasn't changed a bit. The state's gone from 16 million to 40 million part of Jerry Brown's first and second terms 
third terms and fourth terms that the idea if you don't build it, they won't come. If you don't improve the freeways, people will stay off. So when we came up this morning from Los Angeles, we said to ourselves, what wreck are we going to encounter? What mattress will be in the right lane? What shovel will be in the left lane? What trucker will be texting? And what person will be going in the opposite direction? And it's, it's not, you know, I, I've been hit twice by people who left the scene of the accident. We were at Pepperdine not long ago, gotten almost a near head-on at night. So driving on the California freeways is something that's, that's dangerous, even though we're going to have the highest gas taxes. We already have high gas taxes, and we pay the most, uh, we're going to have the costliest fuel when you, when you factor in our formulas and the taxes together. And yet we get very little return for it. For these taxes, what about our schools? They rate 46th on eighth grade test scores. 46th. We have 77 billionaires in California. And the richest counties in the United States, the top 10, I think five of them are in California. And yet, one third of all welfare recipients, even though the state only makes up 12% of the federal population, one third live in California. 22%, one out of five people in California live below the poverty line. It's like La Jolla to Berkeley, 13, 15 min miles inland is one state and everything else is the other. One third of all Californians who are admitted to the hospital for any cause whatsoever upon routine testing are found out to be suffering from diabetes. In my little small town, we have now two federal and state clinics for dialysis. And if you go by there, people are in their 30s. They're not in their 60s. It's an epidemic that no one talks about. One-fourth of all Californians do not, were not born in the United States. That seems to be an enormous challenge. It could be an enormous advantage, but not if you do not believe in the melting pot of integration, assimilation, and integration, but you believe in the salad bowl, hyphenated, accented separatism. So with all this money and all this revenue and all this talent, we get very little for it. I taught at the California State University system. When I went in in 1984 as a professor of classics, the remediation rate, that was a fancy term for those who were admitted into the CSU system, the largest university system in the world, well over a quarter million students, was 32% and the graduation rate in four years, four years, 51% in four years. When I left 23 years later, the remediation rate was 55%, and the average for six years graduation was 49%. So how did California solve that problem? They just got rid of the word last year called remediation. <laughs> So rather than saying 60% of the students who enter the CSU system cannot take a college class because they don't qualify to be there in the first place, and therefore you have to have remediated class, we used to call them bonehead English and bonehead math, and you don't get college credit, now you get college credit for it, and we don't call it remediation anymore, and they solved the problem. There's zero remediation now. But believe me, if we're going to build a high-speed rail, who's going, to, who's going to pilot it? Who's going to engineer it? Somebody who is remediated? So after saying that, to emphasize this idea of schizophrenia, I go over to the coast, and I'm at Stanford University. Last year, the London Times Higher Education Supplement, and it was confirmed by the University of Tokyo, rated the greatest university, supposedly, in the world. You'd think they'd all be Japanese and, and British since they were doing the surveys. Number one, Caltech. Number two, Stanford. Number four, Berkeley. Number 10, UCLA. Number 15, USC. Five of them were from California. California had more top universities than any other nation except the United States, and yet it has a public school system where 60% of the people can't read or write. It's the same state. And believe me, they didn't adjudicate those rankings on the basis of their English departments. They ranked them according to computer science, business, medicine. So what I'm getting at is that whatever's going on in this coastal strip is not going on in Northern California or Central California. 
And I think that's the problem. So let's go to the second part of our thought experiment. The, uh, we've had the symptoms, what's the diagnosis? What's causing this? Now obviously law and legislation, even though we have an interior capital in Sacramento, given the population 25 to 28 million people live along the coastal slip, strip and less than 15 million live in the interior in the north. So law is being adjudicated and created by people from basically San Diego to Berkeley, inland a little bit. And it's a very funny place because it's not, it's a different state than the, the, the rest of us live in. And this is one of the most affluent places in the world. And so people have found that their influence, their capital, and their income shield them from the ramifications of their own ideology. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's very good to be for green power if you're in the Hoover Tower like I am that has neither heating nor cooling and I've never needed it. But I went into Walmart the other day at 107 in Selma and I would swear that every single Hispanic person in my town was in Walmart to get free cooling. Because at 15 cents a kilowatt hour, you can't cool your home when it's 107. Yet the people who put those uh, add-ons on your power bill lived in places like Palo Alto. I won't mention any names because I have close friends at Stanford, but I would say the vast majority are open borders people. But if you've looked at the Bay Area lately, Harker School, Sacred Heart, Castilea, Menlo School, they're expanding like Southern Academies in 1960 during integration. In other words, as the Hispanic service population starts to pour into the Bay Area, very liberal people decided that open borders is pretty good for everybody but themselves. So that they put their kids in private school because they had $30,000 a year per child or more. Same thing with gated estates, very much adamantly opposed to walls on the border, very much for uh, Mark Zuckerberg being a great example of a person who's being audited by the Palo Alto City Council because his propensity for private estates, security barriers is not in sync with his idea that no one should have a, board, uh, a wall at the southern border. And so, if we look at this, one of the problems is that we have two different states, as I said, Massachusetts, Mississippi, but they're, they're segregated by a whole continent. But in the case of California, you have something like Kings and Tulare County being run by people in San Mateo County. And so when you have water, for example, just to take a few issues, we had a four-year drought. We didn't build one dam. They're about a billion and a quarter. So we could have built, for the price of high-speed rails, 100 billion, we could have built 50 dams and reservoirs and got another 12 million acre feet. And who would that have helped? It would have helped the entire state. But they said that they did not like the archaic idea of transference of water. And it's an unnatural phenomenon. Of course, LA here is 15 million people that not one drop of water comes from LA. Same thing with San Francisco. The San Joaquin River, which they diverted water to the ocean for fish experimentation, the reintroduction of salmon that failed at $5,000 a fish, and the, the, the Delta smelt, which we found out had nothing to do with a lack of oxygenated water, but was largely due to evasive species like striped bass that were eating them like candy. But nevertheless, that, that river goes across the Hetch Hetchy conduits. So think of the idea of this coastal mentality that I'm trying to get at. We don't want you farmers and you interior farm workers to dare take water from the Sierra that you've had age-old rights to. And we're going to stop that. But we have age-old rights to Hetch Hetchy that supplies 60% of our water and the California Water Project that supplies another 25. In the case of Hetch Hetchy, it goes right across the San Joaquin River, but we won't put one drop in to save the fish or the smelt. Because that's your problem, not ours. Even though we said it's your problem. Think of that. Can't somebody in San Francisco say, I want to bathe every other day so I can save the smell? No. And so that is, if we're want, wanting to know what this disconnect is about, it's because we have an elite that's not subject to the consequences 
of their utopian dreams. It always falls on somebody else because they have the capital, the education, and the influence to protect themselves in this coastal strip. There's another reason, too. This is, any time in history you have a one-party autocracy, you have no progress, or at least no sustainable progress. Sometime around 2000, California turned in from a red-blue dichotomy into a blue monostate. By that I mean we have super majorities in the assembly and legislature. We've got a democratic governor, democratic judiciary. California is completely irrelevant in national electoral politics. It's the big prize, but it's not a prize anymore because it's always going to be blue. And Republicans and conservatives don't take it seriously, so they don't campaign here much for president, and we don't have a voice in national politics. So we're a one-party state. And what a particular coastal Democrat thinks would be good for the rest of the state will be reified very quickly. That's the second part of the problem. Looking at the other diagnosis, how did that happen? How did we become a one-party state? Did it come out of the head of Zeus? No, it didn't. Over the last 20 years, we've had radical changes in demography in three different areas. The first was that people in the so-called middle, $40,000 to $80,000, have been leaving the state, not in droves, but steadily, about 4 million people. They were mostly conservative. Remember, the Republican Party is not the wealthy anymore, it's not the poor, it's the upper middle and middle classes. The Democrat is, party is very, very wealthy people if you look at county maps by income and very, very poor. And people who were in the middle did not want to pay 8 and 9 percent income tax, 8 or 9 percent sales tax. The property tax was moderated by Prop 13, but the assessments were so high and going because of house prices and there was so much money to be had to sell out if they were fortunate enough to live on the coast that they began to move to Florida, Texas, Nevada, low tax or no tax states. And with them went red votes. And that really hurt the Republican Party. The second was the concentration of wealth was just staggering on the coast. Apple is now valued at almost a, a trillion dollars. I just read an article in preparation for this about, it was in Fortune magazine, which of the next companies will be trillion dollar companies? Facebook, or will it be uh, Hewitt Packard, or will it be Google? And the point is that there is so much money point, uh, coming in through globalization to Silicon Valley that it allows Californians to do things that otherwise would not be financially logical or sustainable. So if you want to make 25% of your power renewal, uh, renewable, and that's going to cost people in the interior, you don't really care because you personally have the money to navigate it around it, and your state itself has the money. About 45% of our state's income comes from income tax revenues, and if you take away the corporate revenue, which is a smaller percentage, individual revenue, uh, taxpayers in the top brackets are about 160,000 people out of 40 million people. About half the state pays no income tax. So when you have that staggering wealth and you have a few individuals who have so much money, they're not really going to complain about high taxes. And we have an enormous amount of wealth. Aerospace, banking, these universities, uh, tourism, and Silicon Valley has warped the perception of, I don't want to be taxed as I won't be competitive to something like, I have other interest in the world, utopian ideas about green, green power, global warming, gay marriage, transgendered bathrooms, because I really am economically immune or exempt from daily worries. So great wealth together with the flight of the middle and, uh, middle and upper middle entrepreneurial class uh, hurt California. And finally, we had illegal immigration. Um, we always say 11 million. I wrote a book, Mexifornia, in 2003, and I was told there was 11 million illegal aliens here. And we're still told that, but it's not a static number. People die, people get green cards, so there is about 500 to 700,000 people who are entering the United States, 75% of whom uh, 
across the border, about 25 or 30 percent, depends on whether you, what figures you leave. Some of them are visa, but some of the people who, who get a visa come from Latin America and South America. So what I'm trying to suggest is it's not a diverse immigration phenomenon. It would be fine if people came legally with English and a high school diploma, and it was a meritocratic and diverse enterprise. And this is sort of what the Trump administration is trying to suggest. I say it would be fine because all scholarly studies show that if immigrants come to the United States and they're educated and they speak English and they have some capital and they're exposed or they live among people who speak different languages, the integration is made so much easier. It does not work very well when people come in mass without English, without legality, without education, without capital, and they congregate with each other. It's the worst thing you could do throughout history if you want to promote assimilation. The second problem was that large body of immigrants uh, looked toward the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party basically said, we're here to subsidize you. And we do not want you to integrate or assimilate or intermarry because when you do, you follow the paradigm of Italian Americans who were all democratic in the 1880s to 1920 and suddenly if your name's Cuomo or Giuliani, we can't predict how you're going to vote. <laughs> we don't want that. We flipped California blue, we flipped Nevada blue, we flipped New Mexico, we want to flip Arizona, we want to flip Texas. We don't want assimilation, so we're going to give you as much uh, amnesty, sanctuary states, sanctuary cities, we'll do whatever we can so you remain tribal in your outlook. Your tribal, racial, and ethnic identity is essential, not irrelevant to your character. The old Martin Luther King idea, the content of our character, not the color of our skill, is irrelevant. And out of that created this entire voice of Atslan, La Raza movement. Remember, Raza was sort of a, a word you weren't supposed to use 30 years ago. It's from Latin, radix, race. And it came into currency in the 1960s with the Mecha and La Raza movement, Voice of Atslan, the newspaper, because people picked it up, not because it was a new word, it's an ancient word, but in the 1930s, Mussolini and, and Franco, Spain, Spanish fascist and Italian fascist, said, Hitler's got a word that denotes something more than living in Germany and speaking German. And it's called Volk. And it's a great word because it excludes Jews and excludes anybody that doesn't look like they're German, supposedly. Although most of the Nazis didn't look too German. So we've got to do the same thing. So Francisco Franco wrote a novel called Rasa. You should read it sometime. It's just incomprehensible. And he made a movie, I've seen it, called Raza. And then Mussolini, being a good Italian, added a Z and we got Raza. And then the 60s came along and people said, wow, La Raza is a great thing. A brown state for a brown people. Everything for La Raza, nothing for the non-La Raza. And we came into a fascistic mindset, which before the Hispanic Mexican American political league, it was all pro-immigration, integration, and assimilation because the numbers were not that great. They were legal. People came through the traditional process. So let me recap where I'm getting at. So if we're looking at this patient at sick California, we see these dichotomies, high taxes, high cost, high housing, very little in return. Poor roads, poor schools, a lot of crime, terrible schools for the people who can't afford it, great schools for the people who are exclusionary. We want to know what causes. It's a one-party state. We don't have any federal representation. You know, we have 53 representatives on the congressional side. I think 38 of them. 38 out of 53, almost 80 percent, or more than 80 percent, 82 percent, I guess, are uh, Democrats. We, our electoral college is irrelevant. We can't, I don't think Donald Trump came any time to California other than to raise money. I don't think any Republican in the foreseeable future will come here for any other reason to find people like yourself to write him a check. People who are Republicans, they're a talls and a sea of uh, progressivism. And then we had illegal immigration, coupled with the flight of the um, upper middle class to non-state. In other words, they said, I can't take this anymore. 
And suddenly I woke up in my house in San Luis Obispo or my house in Monterey. Some techie offered me $1,000 a square foot. Let him raise kids in this stupid state and put them in school. I'm done with it. I'm going to Idaho or I'm going to Texas. That's what happened. I wrote a column about that once. So I went down to the Barstow Avenue U-Haul trailer. I was going to get a hitch, a bike hitch. And I walked in and said, I want to go to Texas. How much does it cost? He said, $1,100 to rent this trailer. I said, what if I just fly to Texas and... and take it back. He said, oh, you, you can bring it back for $150. And that told me a lot, empirically. So if we have the symptoms and we know the diagnosis, what's the therapy? How do you stop it? How do you make it a red-blue dichotomy again? How do you get people integrated and assimilated again? Well, one, th one uh, therapeutic route we know won't work is succession. <laughs> CalExit, we're told by the left, 38% of the state wants to succeed. I just listened to the spokesman. He was the most moronic person I ever heard. He said, we want to succeed. We're the cutting edge, and California's the cutting edge in the world. And I thought, cutting edge? You've got the highest number of people on welfare in the whole country. You've got the highest number of people uh, below the poverty line. You've got the 46 ranked schools in the nation. You've got the 49th. In How do you figure that unless you have not left a cafe on University Avenue. And he looked like he hadn't. So why would he say, and then he said something even more popular. We can just do it as if you don't need three quarters of the states to vote. And then I thought, well, what do you do with the Yosemite? California doesn't own that. They don't own Camp Pendleton. They really don't. They don't own Sequoia. Those are federal properties. I thought, wow. He has never read American history that Fort Sumner was a federal fort and North, uh, South Carolina said it's ours, so they had a war over it. It's somewhere in the powder keg that started the Civil War. And when you think of nullification in sanctuary cities, which he mentioned, we've already had a sanctuary cities, we're going to have a sanctuary state. And I thought, that problem was adjudicated in 1865. We said, you can't do that. You can't override federal law. And I thought, wow, would Cody, Wyoming say that they're a sanctuary gun state? And in the state of, uh, city of Cody, Wyoming, nobody needs to register for a federal gun, just go get it? Can Provo, Utah say, if you don't like that stupid lizard, go ahead and kill him because he's not going to follow the Endangered Species Act? Would people in San Francisco like that if everybody emulated their behavior? So Cal-X, it's not a viable <laughs> cure, obviously. And if it were to be, it would be exactly like the succession of Virginia in 1861. As soon as they wanted to join the Confederacy, the West Virginia said, I don't want any part of this, the poor part of the state. And that's what would happen to us in the San Joaquin Valley in Northern California, the Red State. We'd just say, go ahead. We're going to have a no-tax sort of Wyoming in the middle. It wouldn't be as rich, wealthy, but it might attract a lot of people to California. And East California. Who would want to be, who would want to succeed with a person uh, leading the movement from Palo Alto. So, <laughs> any case, that's not a, a, a viable a solution. So we have to work with the demography that we have. If you stop illegal immigration, you're not going to get 400,000 people into the state who look toward the Democratic Party and feel that they are obligated to them in the, through second and third generation. You're going to get the people here who are 40% claim Latino heritage, they're going to follow the 19th and early 20th century Italian paradigm. In other words, their uh, political affinities will be incidental, not essential to who they are. And they will no, no longer say that my name, if you're, if you're born, I have members of my family that have done this because I'm sort of from a multi-ethnic, that's a fancy word we use now, family, but if your name is, I don't know, Robert Wilson and your mother was Hispanic, said you become Roberto Lopez Wilson hyphenated with two accent marks and that's apparently going to help you career-wise or job-wise or admission-wise. That would all be out the window because it would be intermarriage, integration. Nobody cares whether Rudy Giuliani is Italian. There's no Italian studies program at Fresno State. It just wouldn't happen. And uh, that would happen. And then the Latino 40% of the population would vote on their pocketbook. And they would start asking questions, as many of them already are. Why do I have to go to Walmart to keep cool in a state that ha is the third largest producer of natural gas? Why do I have to do that? 
And why is the legislature wasting my time when I can't drive from Fresno to Bakersfield without getting killed on a two-lane road that hasn't changed in 40 years when they just passed one bill mandating transgendered restrooms, the other it says that I can't, I'll be fine if my dog chases a coyote or bobcat. Those are not essential parts of, what I'm, of my political agenda. So that would be a big change. Closing the border, promoting assimilation, and seeing the Latino block not be a block anymore. That would be a big help. Third, This is a little controversial because I am a free market Hoover Institution conservative. But have you noticed that all of the 19th century progressive dogma, the muckrakers against the robber barons, remember we had Carnegie and Rockefeller and Jay Gould and Fisk and you name it, the Mellons, and all these people. We said that they had monopolized, offshored, outsourced, and we we passed antitrust laws. Why is it that these masters of the universe can avoid $10 billion by offshoring their taxes to Bermuda? And we know that Facebook and Google and Apple did that. And why do they give us lectures about the underclass when they outsource jobs? To other? I, don't, I think people in Fresno would take a job at $12 an hour assembling an iPhone. And why is it that 94% of social media is run by Facebook. And why is it this, I mean, Frank Norris wrote a book called The Octopus, remember about vertical integration of the railroads? Why is Amazon all of a sudden going from selling books to vertically integrating all retail, delivery, food, media, Washington Post, and a classic example of a monopoly, and a vertically integrated one? And so what I think we need to do in California, even though it might be quite quite controversial, we need to bring these people in. Of course, we won't because it, until we change the demography or the attitudes of people because the Democratic Party depends on their contributions. One of the most brilliant things they did was to conclude we have a lot of exposure from the Democratic Party, but if it paid better, they'd be fascist. So we'll give them all the money we want and they will give us a complete exemption from all of our illiberal, non-progressive practices. And the result is they monopolize, they outsource, they offshore, and even product liability. I was thinking the other day, we almost got killed on the freeway. One trucker was texting and moved from the left lane to the center. And then I thought, well, this is crazy. And then I saw another person with not just a phone texting, but with the iPad on the, uh, on the dashboard. And I thought, wow, people say that cigarettes can hurt you, and yet if you smoke, you can sue the tobacco company. You go into a bar and have a drink, get in the car, they sue, now the, they sue the alcohol company. You can sue almost anybody for product liability when a product is not used as intended. Why does Silicon Valley say that you can text when they make a device that they know now has a higher rate of lethality than driving while under the influence, and yet nobody says, can't they just make an app that says it shuts down at 10 miles an hour? So what I'm getting at is that we have, an, we have uh, people with inordinate amounts of wealth, and I'm not, I'm not against that, but what I am against are getting lectures from progressives about liberality and compassion when they have allowed our modern robber barons to get away with murder. And I think if you s sat those people down and said, you know what, we're going to start looking at you in a different way, then people would not censor people at Google or they would not turn those companies in to an arm of the progressive Democratic Party because they've had a baleful influence. They really have. If you start, I mean, just yesterday, Apple donated to the Seven Poverty Law Center because of, and that's not, that's what they do and, uh, they also divert attention because they're not regulated and they're exempt. They give an enormous amount of money to the Progressive Party and it means that a Republican or Conservative candidate has a, lot, a great deal of uphill fight against them. So we really do have a 19th century robber baron culture along the coast and we have an impoverished uh, pre-modern society that's not postmodern like the coast. The coast is postmodern. The interior is pre-modern, and that doesn't work in a, in a single state. Finally, 
What's the prognosis if these things are not done? If we don't make these changes about immigration and politics and uh, some of the people who uh, are so-called trillionaire entrepreneurs, I think that we're going to be uh, in two different states in a way that we haven't seen before. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, if you're in Palo Alto, I have a friend who was cited by the city because his mailbox was two or three inches too low. Think about it. One quarter mile from where I live, a person moved in. He brought in four Winnebago's. They didn't run, put them on blocks. And at one time we had, I think, 15 dogs, 30, uh, there were 30 children, the bus stopped, and everybody filled up the bus from that one residence. There were at least five different families. Uh, we used to have mosquito abatement uh, districts. There was standing water all over stagnant water. There is absolutely no regulation in the interior of California. I used to ride my bike. One of the reasons I quit is because canteens on the side of the road would go out in the afternoon or evening and take their plugs out and drain all of their water and waste all over the rural roads of California. It happens all the time. So what I'm getting at is that we, why we're talking and why I mentioned Stanford or Caltech or Facebook or Google, the state is regressing into a third world country. It really is. And there's parts of Fresno or parts of Selma that you you wouldn't want to go to. When you wake up in the morning and there's dead puppies or dogfight carcasses thrown on your property and routinely, or sofas or toxic waste, you can see that something's going on. And the, what's going on is we have, as I said, the no, greatest number of poor people, but also the most highly regulated state that is completely inapplicable to people who have no money. And so their idea is that when I came to the States, the first thing I did was break the law. So why should I follow any other subsequent law? There's no reason to. And so what I'm concluding with is that we're at a crisis point. California is either going to become Mississippi or it's going to become Massachusetts, but it's not going to be both anymore. It just doesn't work. And what we need to do is tell people on the coast that as compassionate progressives, you better worry about your brother in the interior. And when you don't, all of the noble rhetoric, all of the money, all of the hip, cool image, uh, it's not going to exempt you from a moral reckoning. Thank you very much.